National College of Dentists is an honorary organization composed of dentists from throughout the world. The USA section of the college decided to record visually not only the history of the college but also several leaders in our profession. Dr. H. O. Westerdahl, Secretary General Emeritus of the college, was selected as the outstanding individual to be honored with the first videotape. The purpose of these tapes is to recognize those people who have contributed significantly to the dental profession. How great it would be if we had G.V. Black on an audiovisual tape. Wouldn't it be wonderful to bring back Pierre Fouchard, the father of modern dentistry? Another purpose of this project of the college is to explore the qualities of leadership. What makes good leaders? What qualities lead them to the top? and what can we and future generations learn from them. This program in the series of the Chronicles of Outstanding Leaders in Dentistry highlights the career of Ralph W. Phillips. Dr. Phillips is interviewed by Dr. Richard Adelson. Ralph, let me um, get, get started in this conversation with just talking about something that, that I've gleaned from talking with people about you and what I've read and, and the, the kind of words that come up are that Ralph Phillips is the dental materials guru or the living leg legend in dental materials. And I wonder if you could start by telling us how that happened. Well, first of all, those, uh, those comments unquestionably came from my relatives <laughs> <laughs> and close friends that I paid right to, right. to say that. Oh, you know, people didn't know you do too That's well. right, don't know me. There's some uh, in this city that could fill you in on the other side. Um, but the way I got started on it, I, I had a background in physical chemistry at Indiana. And at that time, the dean of the school, Bill Crawford, was looking to set up a department of biomaterials, as it were. And um, I became interested in the position after talking with him. Now, was this at the dental school? This was at the dental school. This was at, at the time when Crawford had just become the dean there, and they had no research in the school. And I walked into a situation that uh, was not particularly comfortable because there was no facility of any kind. I knew nothing about dentistry and have learned uh, relatively little since then, probably. Now, now what year that's was that what started. About? That was in uh, 44. Now, now, your background and training is, is not in dentistry. No, it's in chemistry. Uh, I think if you go back historically through the people who have made contributions in this field, a very high percent have been in one of the basic sciences. This is on the premise that sometimes it's easier to take a person in a basic science, engineering, chemistry, physics, and so forth, metallurgy, teach him the dental application rather than it is to take a dentist who has had no science background and try to make a scientist out of him. There are people that are exceptions to this, such as, as George Paffenbarger, who had both a dental degree and a background in science as well. But, but my, I started out that way and then slowly but surely built a, a program at Indiana. Tell me a little bit about Crawford and, and that, that decision of yours to, to start to take a look at dental materials as a, as a possible career move. Well, I, I, I think I was ready at that time to, uh, to become occupied and, and uh, seek a career. To me, as I looked at the opportunities in Indiana, why they seemed to be... Uh, a great potential. Crawford was a very strong administrator who firmly believed in developing a program materials. He had been in materials at Tennessee, as you may recall, then at Columbia, and had dedicated himself to building the program. And I had pretty much uh, freedom within the monies that, that we had. I walked into a room that had nothing in it, and we slowly but surely put it together. What was, what was the, the state of the art of dental materials at that time? You're talking about 1944. A great different than it, than it is, uh, than say, during the past possibly 15 years. At that time, people in, in materials were very concerned about nice, clean numbers, about measuring compressive strength of amalgam, setting reactions, uh, 
uh, gypsum products and so forth. And then when you would ask them uh, the practical application, the usual remark, well, that's up to the dentist to decide what these numbers mean. Now, however, the impetus is, has uh, rapidly accelerated to making materials more practically oriented. And that was not true at that time. And there were a few of us, and, and I think my, my thinking along that, that line was particularly pointed up by and influenced by Crawford, who had always thought in that direction. And that was, that was contrary to the way of thinking of, of the pioneers in the field, the Skinners and the Paytons and so forth. Was there any thought of possibly leaving Indiana? I know you've, you've got a long yeah. career there. Yeah, I, I've had, uh, as anybody does, if you hang around the game long enough, had some opportunities for positions at NIDR, a couple of deanships and so forth. But I don't think I ever felt very strongly, well, I know that I didn't, because uh, Indiana had been very good to me. I felt comfortable there. I had built up and still have, and this is a great part of the success we have had, a loyal, capable group of people that have worked with me. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I felt I could accomplish more within my career by staying there with an operation that was beginning to unfold than going somewhere else and starting all over again. Let me, let me trace it back a little bit. Just, just before you came to the dental school, you're, you mentioned that your background is, is chemistry, physical chemistry. Right. And, and, and your training in that also was at Indiana. Right. How did, how did some, some of those decisions get made? Do you of going to Indiana? Well, and, and also interest in chemistry. Uh, <clears throat> well, actually, I didn't, I didn't uh, go to Indiana uh, with the purpose of, of studying chemistry. As a matter of fact, I went to Indiana on a basketball scholarship. Oh, did you? And probably one of the best things that happened to Indiana basketball is I decided <laughs> after playing for a couple of months that, that I was out of my class because the, the group that I was with eventually went on to one of the finals of the NCAA. But I started on a basketball scholarship but really intended to go into law. My father, who was an invalid all of my life, was a Methodist minister and he'd always felt that either theology or uh, maybe law would be the thing that I should do. My mother, however, had a background in science. She taught, uh, after my father's illness, taught chemistry and biology at the high school where I grew up in Salem, Indiana. And so I, that eventually uh, came to focus, I guess, in my mind. Mm. So very shortly after Indiana, I went into chemistry and worked as, a, as an assistant in the chemistry department and so forth. And, it probably it was just an innate thing that came to mm. be. Oh, so you played high school basketball? Well, I played at high school basketball. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's that's interesting. Yeah, as anybody in in Indiana does, you grow up with a basketball in your hand. Yes, you, know, right. you shoot goals when you're coming back and forth from school and so right, forth. Right, right, right. Oh, that 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 is interesting. And uh, you decided that law was was not the thing for you. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I just, uh, it just wasn't my thing, I guess, because I, I had a, a, a liking for science, and so I got out of that. I, I guess as a, about that era, I, one of my ambitions was, was really also music, and to a certain extent, I had a band in high school, and I played in a band in, in college and played with a couple of the big bands in the summer in the northern part of the mm. state, Johnny Long. Played a trumpet and I had it in Beijing, I suppose one time being another Harry James, and I soon right. learned that that wasn't <laughs> gonna happen either. And uh, so I, I gave that up as well. But, but really, I, I think uh, uh, I turned out, to, I, I ended up doing exactly what I was best suited to do mm. if, if uh, I've had any success at all, and that was to be into the science era. And yet, um, and have you stayed with the with the trumpet at all? Yeah, I play it occasionally. I, I'm uh, not very proficient at it at the present <laughs> time, but I play it occasionally, but not not recently, no. Oh, oh, that that is that is neat. I, I want to get back to. Well, it's neat if you haven't heard me play. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd, I'll, I'll I'll tell you a story sometime about my experience with the with okay. the bugle. Well, <laughs> Um, I, I want to get back to something that, that you said about the, the, the whole evolution of dental materials because I think that's mm -hmm. a kind of an interesting, interesting area and I, and I just want to read to you something that, that, that you've written and um, get you to, to maybe talk about it a little bit. 
Um, and in, this, was a, this was a talk that you gave back in 1977 um, on when you received the Henry, is it Spinatel, Spinatel Award? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you talked then about um, just as the dentist has at last become aware that at the end of a tooth is a body, so have we come to realize that there is a viable interface between the restoration and living tooth. And you go on to talk about the, um, the oriented application of material science to biological systems. And I think that sounded to me like a kind of a significant change in, in what was happening in oh, yeah. materials yeah, that, research. That, I, should, I should have mentioned that. When, when you asked the question about um, uh, what was materials research like in edu and the mm -hmm. academic life, when I first started in, one of the great differences above and beyond this, this uh, uh, now focus upon clinical research to tie in in vitro studies with the in vivo setting was a greater awareness by the material scientist of the biocompatibility aspect of materials. Uh, so now the precursor to everything else all of us look at is, is what is the tissue response to a material, which is, is the beginning above and beyond adhesion, wear, resistance, and so forth. And, and dentistry is locked into that now anyway because the two regulatory agencies in dentistry, namely the Council on Dental Therapeutics, Council on Dental Materials of the ADA, mm -hmm and the FDA, of course, required then certain rigid control over the safety to the professional person and to the, mm -hmm. the public that the professional person serves. Uh, that was not true 20 years ago, but now it is. And as you look mm -hmm. at the, because as what you do is you look at the program of the American Association for Dental Research or the International Association for Dental Research, you will find that the material sections are heavily weighted, or those sections related to materials, heavily weighted on, on looking at, at tissue response to new and existing formulations. Hmm. And that, in, in my, contrary to what some of my colleagues who still feel that this is divorced from the area, but I, I think this is terribly important, and we work very closely with the people in pathology and toxicology at Indiana. Hmm. It's, it's a way of life you have to accept. Have, have we done a good job in dentistry in, in bringing that whole bioengineering area into the... Well, know? I think so. I think, I, I think that, that if you talk to the people in, in the area of orthopedic surgery, for example, that they will acknowledge that, that the steps that dentistry has taken for a long time are vastly superior to controls that they have had in terms of uh, precise specifications for the, the mm. nature of the structure they put in, the way it's designed, and so forth. Yeah, I think dentistry has done that. And as a matter of fact, that the, the FDA has leaned very heavily upon, upon the American Dental Association to provide them the guidelines that they use in, in their agency. Uh, in other words, what they say is, you've done a good job of policing your shop, and we accept your standards, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. instead of creating new ones for you to have to uh, provide another hurdle for you to jump. Hmm. It, it's, it's interesting, though, and, I, and in the this, in this same paper, um, you also talked about the, um, the paradox of research, that at the same time that it, that it solves certain problems, it opens up a whole bunch of new questions. And I'm, I'm sort of wondering now, just uh, you know, as you take a look at, at, at how dental materials have evolved over the, the, let's see, that must be 44 years since you started at, at uh, let's make it 42 years since you started Indiana. What, where you see things are right now, and, and what you see as some of the unsolved problems. Uh, it's a thoughtful question. I'm not sure I can can come to grips with it completely because this depends a great deal on where your interests are and where your capabilities lie and, and looking into a crystal ball and making these types of determinations. But I would say that that uh, <clears throat> some of the major problems that, that dental research faces in the area of biomaterials it, it one centers around on adhesive systems molecules that will sit down on <clears throat> cementum, enamel, dentin, and stay there in the rigors of the oral cavity. And that leads up then to a, to a panorama of various types of, of uh, difficulties. 
of creating a, a molecule which will wet the surface, one that will adhere to wet, dirty, unhomogeneous, low surface energy substrata. And so that then leads into to developing a communication with people in the physical chemistry area, people in surface phenomena, and so forth. And so you will find that more and more people in those non-dental areas are become interested in this very unique application. It's intriguing, you see. Mm. Of, of looking at the tooth, which is all messed up in terms of adhesion. And some of the, the major mm. problems in dental practice and in, the, and in orthodontics, of banding teeth and everything, are related to not having truly adhesive systems. And, and you could go on from there if you look at the area of metallurgy. Amalgam, there's nothing as fascinating to the metallurgist as amalgam. Here's a material which which uh, at room temperature or mouth temperature undergoes a series of complicated solid state reactions forever, never comes to equilibrium. And mm -hmm. the metallurgist, this is vastly more interested, interesting than looking at vitalium type materials mm -hmm. or even blades on a jet motor sometimes. So the, the, uh, uh, I think the area of, of adhesion is one that can be cited that that uh, has a, is of terribly great importance to dentistry at this time in terms of aesthetic dentistry, cosmetic dentistry, routine operative procedures. At the same time, it comes to grips then with difficulties associated with that phenomena. Another problem that dentistry, of course, is facing now is that research solves problems, it creates them. And one is not in my area, but what fluoride has done. Fluoride has changed totally the nature of dental practice, hasn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As you know, being a dentist and, and having a background in restorative dentistry, you just don't, don't see dental caries the way that you used to. So that means that dentists now have an opportunity to do other things they didn't have time for. And, and what are the, what's the implication of that change for, for the dental materials researcher? Well, it's a, it's a very real one. Uh, the, let, let's say, Dick, that you're going to, uh, that, that somebody comes to you in a dental materials program and says, I have a half a million dollars. I wish they would come to me <laughs> and say that. <laughs> but they come to you and say, I have a half a million dollars. And uh, I want you to study only one thing. Right. You can't spread this over a series of things. You, you, you hone in on one thing. What would it be? Well, you'll get a great difference of opinion about that. Certainly, in my judgment, Amalgam wouldn't get one dollar of that mm. because I don't think the opportunities for adhesion, for cosmetics and so forth, enter into to that particular system. So probably one would say that, that um, where the material scientist then fits in to be competitive in the marketplace for monies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to do what his primary responsibility is above his own career is to render a service to the profession, then lies in trying to make a judgment on where his monies, wherever they come from, should be spent. Right. Uh, and you have to do a little bit of everything because a, a major time, you did a mm -hmm. tape with, with Dr. Hein, who again was mm -hmm. one of the people that made possible uh, a program for me at Indiana following Crawford. And, and our success at Indiana has been based upon a number of things, but one is very strong administrative support from the university and from the dean, and, and Hein was one. And, and Dr. Hein always had the philosophy, he said that a basic science department materials, pathology, microbiology is in essence primarily a service department for the clinical areas. Mm -hmm. I believe that strongly. And one of the strengths at Indiana has been that, that there are no walls between the basic science areas and the clinical departments. I, I want to come back to that again in, okay. just a little bit later, but I want you to come back to your half a million dollars again. All right. And um, we're now offering you to in, in your laboratory in Indiana to work on one thing. And, yeah. and uh, half a million dollars, this comes from the International College, uh, yes. I accept that. Yes. I'm very pleased about it. <laughs> then worth my trip out yes. here. Yes, right. glad, <laughs> glad to help you out. Yeah, thank you. Um, what are you gonna work on? Um, I'd, work, I'd, I'd work on polymers. 
Mm -hmm. I, I think that the opportunity for, for, uh, for accomplishing what dentistry needs in terms of aesthetic dentistry, in terms of maxillofacial prostheses, in terms of making dentistry more conservative, of making dentistry more permanent, making it more biocompatible, et cetera, lies in the area of, of polymers. And that, that embraces the an adhesion and, and the whole... Uh, let me just present one second, if I might, Dick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I held a, 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 a symposium at Indiana some years ago, which was related to, as I remember, the 50th year celebration of the dental school. And without a great deal of imagination, I called this dentistry in the year 2000. Mm. And the idea, you see, Dick, was to pick the brains, as we're doing here, learned people in the field. I had Cy Crashover from NIDR at that time, Joel Volker, whose name everybody knows, Al Morris, Denton Cooley came and, mm -hmm. and talked about where heart implants were going as an evening speaker. And the one that, that I asked to depict what dental practice would be like, see the other people mm -hmm. dealt with dental research, dental education, so right, forth, right. was uh, Ben Pavoni, who's been a good friend, mm -hmm. and you may mm -hmm. know Dean at the University of yep. California. And that's a difficult assignment, but don't feel sorry for Ben. He's yeah, done a number yes, on me <laughs> many times. But, but ask him, what would dental practice be like? And if you go back at, at the proceedings, which I recorded of that, of that particular symposium, it was, it was remarkable. Ben predicted, and that was before this was happening, actually, uh, marketplace clinics, mm. shopping center clinics. He said, this is going to come to be, and it was. Tell and me again what the symposium was? Pardon? What year was the symposium? I don't remember. This was about, I, I'm guessing, uh, Dick, probably the, the middle 60s. Uh-huh. Okay. That era. Then he, uh, now that was some years ago. Mm-hmm. And then he said, in, in terms of restorative dentistry, the average, the typical dentist in the year 2000 will be using only one material. They mm -hmm. won't use combination, but they use one material. And he said, in my considered opinion, that will be a polymer. He asked me afterward what I thought, because I hadn't read the paper, and I would hate to bet that, that he's wrong. So I think that the area of polymers, because of, of how fast the field is moving, the opportunities that lie, would probably be, if I had the right group with me, would be the way that I would go. Mm. That, that, that's interesting. and, and I. I think you were saying something that was important and I'd like to hear just a little bit more about and that is that in, in lots of ways the, the dental materials in terms of serving as a service to the, the clinical aspects of dentistry needs to be aware of, of where the clinical practice is going. And, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that practice and, and you mentioned one is that there would be a single material but you also talked about things like maxillofacial prosthesis and aesthetics. Is, is that what you think dentistry is going to be doing primarily? Well, I think that, that uh, as, people, as people live longer, as they keep their teeth longer, then there are different types of dyscrasia that occur to begin with. The so-called eroded area is, I believe every dentist will admit, is becoming more and more of a mm -hmm. common day occurrence of areas of, of dentin and cementum are exposed. And now there are various avenues of restoring this conservatively without anesthesia, without preparing the mm. typical class five restoration. And uh, that involves a, a number of different types of materials and different types of therapy. In the area of maxillofacial, that, that's an example in, mm. in restorative dentistry. Maxillofacial prosthesis, I think, is in, in a little bit the same sense is, is undergoing that because people are living longer, there are more people that in time develop carcinoma of, mm -hmm. of various uh, areas of the, of the face and of the oral cavity. And unfortunately, really if you go back, you will find that the people doing research in developing better materials that are more cosmetic, that, that uh, uh, maintain cosmetics longer, that may adapt themselves better to tissues, that, that money for research has been pretty much barred or stolen. Those people have not had sums of money. 
And many of us that have served in, in an advisory capacity to NIDR have made a strong plea, and I think it is falling on receptive ears now, to earmark money for that type of research for those people who desperately need help. Well, it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you, you paint an exciting you know, sort of future for dental materials research. I, I want to talk to you about the, the, the quality of it, though, and I, um, I just want to read something that I thought was kind of exciting. And um, this goes back to, again, 77. You said universities um, and supporting agencies must abandon present preoccupation with trivial research and bookkeeping based on the number of papers published per year an attempt to achieve an atmosphere in which a Galileo, Newton, or Gibbs would find it congenial to work. And I'm just sort of wondering now, with this kind of need for dental materials research, what you think the, the dental schools need to be doing to create that atmosphere? Uh, those are uh, nice words put together. I think I stole that from somebody else, which <laughs> most of my stuff is either barred or stolen anyway. But um, no, I think there's, there is great truth in, in that, Dick, that, that general. Uh, philosophy. Um, one of the one of the real problems in dental school, from the standpoint of developing ongoing and meaningful research programs in materials at the educational level and at the research level, has been their their lack of attention to the importance of that area. If you if you go back 20 years and look at the centers of excellence in biomaterials, in dental mm. schools in this country, you can count them almost on one hand. Mm. You go today, you can count them almost on one hand. You find mm. the same groups. And, and there are reasons for this. One is that many administrators have become more and more biologically oriented. They're concerned with behavioral science and so forth, and therefore they say, we have to spend our money here in peri and so forth rather than in materials. Secondly, I can well appreciate that they have to have somebody in the, on the operative floor on Wednesday mm -hmm. afternoon. And, and if they give up that for a person in materials, why the clinical areas suffer, and that's the primary responsibility of a dental mm -hmm. school training dental students. So materials has suffered in that many administrators have not seen the, the, the opportunities here. And secondly now, because of the shortage of funds, even if they want to, they don't have the money for it. So what do you see as, as some of the, the possibilities that, that one might explore if one was to try to promote more dental materials research at the schools? I mean, given all of the economic problems that they're I facing. think, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's difficult. It, you know, we, we have visitors that will come by or somebody that is, is coming out of a graduate program of materials, and they come to our group, which I have quite a few people and facilities. They go to Michigan, they go to Northwestern, they come and see what Danny Duncanson is doing here. And, and they get discouraged. They say, I don't have anything but an empty room. And I, I don't have an SEM, and I don't have a microprobe, and I don't have animals even to do mm. biocompatibility studies. And it's a hopeless task, and I, I, I'll never be able to develop a mm. program. You have to start. Mm. I started, we all started with nothing, you build on it. So one is that you have, and you can do research with, you can do research with a binocular microscope. Mm -hmm. You can do research because a dental school has bodies. You've got yep. patients. Yep. Yep. And if you can organize in a meaningful way, you can do research. That's one. Then secondly, and this is where I work long and hard, and I was fortunate to have people that were receptive to developing a communication with the clinical areas. They have to understand what you're doing. You have to understand their problem. And if you're not willing to do that, you're lost. You'll never mm -hmm. become a viable segment in the dental school. You, you cannot have a laboratory you put around with your testing machine and not talk to the people in the clinical area. You look at the schools that have good materials program and I'll bet you will find that seldom if ever do they use a technique or a material that the materials department does not also recommend. Hmm. So yeah. uh, let me encapsulate it by saying that, uh, if, if I may do, by saying that I think to begin a program, one is you have to have a receptive administration that will give you some time, money. You have to start doing research and you don't have to have 
a whole panorama of equipment to do it, and you have to, maybe more important than anything else, develop a line of communication with the people that are going to use the mm -hmm. data that you're going to develop. Yeah, I think that's critical. What about um, the relationship with industry? Is Do you see that as, as fruitful? Oh, yes. I, I've always felt that way. There, there, And this, again, is one of the changes that occurred there. There was a time some years ago that if one were going to give a, uh, conduct a study that was sponsored by Johnson & Johnson, Cook, and so forth, it'd be frowned upon. It was tainted. Mm -hmm. No one would ever participate in a, without fears of real repercussion, ever participate in a symposium organized by a dental manufacturer. That's no longer the case. Um, dental manufacturers, by and large the research people of most manufacturers, are honest, capable people. They're interested in developing and supporting research that they do not have the facilities for. Um, of, of the money that I have right now in dental research, which I guess my budget from outside funding is a couple of hundred thousand maybe a year, um, at least half of that is from industry. And, mm -hmm. and I, I have no uneasiness about it. I feel it's not tainted mm -hmm. because my reputation is totally based upon integrity. Mm -hmm. The minute that a dentist says, I wonder about him because of his relationship with such and such a company, it's over. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. finished. So you can't take that chance, but everybody has industrial research and that will, that will continue to be so for a variety of reasons. One is the increasing shortage of money at the national level for dental research. Mm -hmm. And secondly, because industry now, because of the specification and regulatory processes, has to have data from unbiased sources, particularly clinical data. Right. And they're probably eager to have a window on the advancements well, yeah. of science, which you're able to provide. Indeed they are. Yeah. Indeed they are. I, I want to now come back to the, the relationship between the, the research scientist and the, and the clinician, and mm -hmm. I, I, I think this sort of relates to... I wish you'd quit reading my publication, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, I'm going to read something yeah. about you now. Um, and, and this was when you received the William Guise Award, and it, it says, perhaps the most significant contribution Dr. Phillips has made uh, are in bridging the gap between dental material science and clinical dentistry so that practicing dentists can discriminate between fact and propaganda and thus select and apply materials and techniques intelligently. Um, tell, me, tell me about that as a, as a role as you've moved, you know, clearly you've not stayed in the laboratory. No, uh, I wish I could spend, because that's, that's the fun in doing research is to, to actually do it yourself in the laboratory. That's where you start. And, and when you have people working for you and they give you the data, you don't quite have the feel for it as when you develop it. But I, I guess that's a, a pretty fair statement that, that if one would pick out maybe one thing that, that I or not prefer to say we have done in the program at Indiana is that at a time when, as I indicated a half hour or so ago, when there was not that philosophy of bridging the gap between the lab, or even desire to bridge mm. the void between laboratory and clinical data. So we started uh, uh, developing clinical research program because I felt a school that would, would develop that type of attitude would be developing, therefore, a, a, have a, a major input into dental practice. Clinical research is difficult. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. It's challenging. You have to you have to have a, a person assigned to it. He has to have a place for it. He can't scurry around mm -hmm. uh, one day a week trying to find an operator. He has to have an assistant. He has to be able to retrieve the patients. He has to develop criteria for monitoring mm -hmm. them. He has to maintain their dentistry above and beyond what he did. And many people are not willing to make those sacrifices. Well, we started doing this back at, with a person by the name of, you may find the literature, Rafael Nadal, who was a Puerto Rico graduate student in operative. And we began uh, with a study on amalgam. We did, I think, you will find the, the because it was an area I was interested in, the first clinical evaluation of using a composite in a posterior restoration. Mm -hmm. adapting with uh, Dave Avery, who's now head of PETO at, at Indiana. 
And so we, we slowly but surely began to develop that, that type of posture in our program. And that now is one assumed by any number of centers of excellence in the field. There's, there's something else that you do that I, I, I want to hear you talk about. And I, I think not only have you done that you know, in your research center, but I think the amount of time that you spend traveling around the country, talking to dental societies, continuing education groups, universities, practitioners, um, that, that's really another piece of, of and appears to be a major piece of what you do. And I'm, I wonder how you... Yeah. Uh, it, it is a major piece. People often ask how many, <clears throat> how many hours I, or how many days a year traveling, talking, and I, I, I really don't keep track of it, but, but a lot. And, and there, some of my colleagues can say, why, why do you run out to, I, I come back to Oklahoma City this fall, mm -hmm. for example, and give a course again. Why do you go to Oklahoma City? Uh, you should stay home and take care of your own shop. It'd be more profitable to you and to your group to be there on hand. If the dentist in Oklahoma would read now and then, they know all you're going to tell them. I don't look at it quite that way. Dentistry is a, dentistry is a difficult profession. It's tiring physically, mentally. I can't envision a dentist after a hard day in an office, going home, having a cocktail or dinner, sitting down with the Journal of Dental Research and reading it. He doesn't feel comfortable with it. He, he doesn't understand the people, which is important as mm -hmm. what they are writing. And so I think the continuing education is terribly, terribly important. And we, again, as, as I have continually stressed, we have felt that our major responsibility our major challenge is to help the dentist. That's the only reward in doing research, is that hope some of this will be useful to the dentist. So here he has mm. this avalanche of new materials, new concepts and so mm. forth. He has to be brought up to date, and, and yes, I've been doing that a long time. I enjoy it. Um, you good at it? Uh, I'm not sure I'm good at it. I try hard. Uh, it, it, it's mm. not easy. My approach to it has always been to take the research, the science part, make it palatable for the dentist to then accept it. In yeah. other words, I, I want him to understand why I say something rather than just tell him to use this one or that one. Are you conscious of, of what you're doing? I, mean, I, I see you as being incredibly successful at, at that task of interpreting research to the, to the clinician. Um, are you conscious of, of what you're doing that makes that successful? Uh, well, that's assuming I am successful. I, 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 well, let's as, assume you are. Well, let's, uh, let's, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> let's assume between you and I. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think maybe I, I, I recognize this simply because I've tried so hard at it and because of response from, from groups through the years. You, you look at the people who have been successful in the lecture circuit type of thing. You, you've had mm. Miles Markley. Those people almost always are not talking about a fetish type of thing. They're talking about fundamentals. Mm -hmm. That's what they're talking about. And they will keep that up to date in terms of the new technology. What mm -hmm. I talk about now to a dental society is almost 100% different than it was five years ago mm -hmm. because of the change in the field. And, and you have to keep up with the dentist has to. There was a time 20 years ago, Dick, you come to Oklahoma City, and they announced that somebody's going to give a lecture on dental materials, the dentist would leave town. Mm -hmm. There would be a mass exodus, all going to Tulsa or something, get out of the city because they envisioned what they had had in school, Bernal hardness numbers, phase diagrams, all that stuff. It's not true anymore. The dentist has to know something about it because of, of the changes in dental therapy that are occurring forced upon mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. And so, so therefore, I, I think dentists are receptive as they weren't before. I think that there, it, it complicates our, our position though, you, because you see, it's taking money away from fundamental research. When, when uh, and anybody materials has this problem that when, when a new type of material comes out, posterior composite, mm -hmm. glass on them or cement, something comes out, a bunch of new products, then, then I'm picking up the phone every hour. What do you mm -hmm. think about such and such a product? So you have to take time away from fundamental research to test it, to determine whether the manufacturer's claims are valid or not. 
by the time you do all this, then he's got product X2 out, and you start all over again. Yep, yep. That, that's where the service area becomes complicated. Yeah. Let me ask you something. I, I know there's an effort in, in the dental school to try to get uh, dental students to better evaluate what they read in the literature. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's that example you gave about sitting, well, if the person sat down with the Journal of Dental Research, right. they, they would know all of this. I'm wondering whether or not we need to make students um, better able to interpret the research, or maybe we need more Ralph Phillips type people. To, uh, 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 probably both. Mm -hmm. I, I think we need more people that, that have, uh, I feel uncomfortable in, in, in this, Dick, that some of the people that have come out of PhD programs in, uh, in science that have been supported by NIDR have never really, never really appreciated the, the, the opportunities that lie in this, in this clinical application. They, they simply want to go in and, and remain for the rest of their life doing x-ray diffraction mm -hmm. on gypsum products or something like that. And I don't know how to, to, to cope with that exactly. We try to make all of our graduate students assume the philosophy, be it right or wrong, that, that we have mm -hmm. had. Um, that, that is one thing, that they, they want to continue working in a, in a very narrow area. And that's not, that's not what materials is. Mm -hmm. It has to embrace a, a lot of different things. And secondly, I think that again, many of them, many of them have not been willing to communicate with the clinical areas. Mm. Yeah, and, and I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm sort of torn. I, I I hear that, and then sometimes I think maybe there needs to be that community of of research scientists and the community of clinicians and people like yourself who serve as the interpreter between one group and yeah. the other. But but to come back to your question, that that's one of the problems is that the people in materials so frequently. Have 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 not had the, the burning desire to yeah. to carry this into dentistry, and and some of the organizations in dentistry have not have not I think made use of their facilities to to make research findings available to the practitioner. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's been talking about this, but it hasn't done as well as it possibly should have done. Even yeah. the IADR, we talked about this. The second thing, though, the point that you made that is, a, is, is very important, and that is how to make the student research-oriented in, in the sense of, of, of a, an inquisitive type mind. It's easier now than it was because the kids now are smart. They have mm -hmm. background in sciences. They, they think along those lines. But how to develop in the dental school curriculum ways of making them want to search out the literature and, and read it and understand it without an assignment in a, in a course is, is an elusive thing that, that I don't... How, how, well do you think, how well do you think we're doing at that? Not uh, very well. Uh, I think we are at the graduate level. At the undergraduate level, I don't think so. The dental school curriculum is being compacted more and more. More courses are being put in, and uh, they, they are not required to read as much as they used to. Hmm. You, the textbooks are, you know, a few years ago, the student had to buy textbooks. He got a, he got a box full of textbooks, you remember? Mm -hmm. Before he could get into a class, he had to do that. That is usually not required. They simply, in many places, are recommended books. Even if they are required to buy it, the student is not forced to read mm -hmm. the book, which is bad. If he, mm -hmm. if he has to pay the money to buy the book, he should have to read it to get through the course. Uh, and usually now they're simply recommended texts, so students are not required to read like they, they used to, and they don't have mm. time to do it. So uh, I don't know. Uh, this this is even true at the graduate level, Dick. Well, one thing that that I did for this is an aside, but it's germane maybe. Um, I taught for a while in our graduate program. I discontinued it, but maybe I'll start again a one-hour course a week, and this was available to all graduate students in every field, called essentially grantsmanship. The idea mm -hmm. about this was to, to have the student, the graduate student, develop a research proposal. Mm -hmm. Now this was a proposal that, that could not be parallel to one that he was doing as a, as a graduate student. And what he did then was have the typical NIDR proposal, develop a, a, uh, a review of the literature, a statement of the problem, 
significance of accomplishing the end result, materials, methods, budget, and so forth. And then we would we would paw through these and mm -hmm. point out what was good and bad about each one. And it, it was uh, quite effective, I think. You know, and, and I think what it sounds like is the discipline of, of having to think through that research problem. That's right. And are, are you saying that, that you think this might be a, a useful activity for dental students? I think if you could, if you could fit it in the program, something like this might be very useful. One way around this, it's, it's a small entree into it, but I've, I have always uh, made use of dental students in, uh, as research technicians paid through either from university funds mm -hmm. or outside mm -hmm. grants and so forth. I have right now I think five working full time in the summer, weekends, evenings during the year. Uh, they some of these, by virtue of that, have been enticed into staying into dental research. I can name two mm -hmm. chairmen of the department in Indiana who I think had their beginning in, in academic life working as research technicians with, with us. Um, now, there are some people that have frowned on this. They say you get a dental student, you put him in here, and, and they have a great impact upon their classmates. Mm. The classmates all come to to uh, John Brown over here because he's been working materials to ask him questions about him having a problem in casting and so forth. Mm -hmm. They ferret out, said, here's, mm. here's a student we ought to have working right. for you and so right. forth. But, but some of my friends that I've tried to talk in this said, it's been a disaster. I get this guy and he, he's a foul ball and I can't get him to work and so forth. I think that usually, in my experience, is due to one, they haven't picked out a person who has the right science background mm -hmm. and a feel for that. Secondly, they assign him to something that he's not really interested in. You can't have a metallurgist, a person that has a master's in metallurgy, feeding rats mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. type of thing or vice versa. Yeah. That it has to match up with what that student yes. himself is, is interested in doing. And, and one of the things, one of my concerns about, about whether we will have major breakthroughs in research, Dick, it's a little side from this subject, but there's a point. Uh, one of my concerns about major breakthroughs is that, that we are having less and less money appropriated for dental research, as, as Dean Allen and you and I were talking about at breakfast this morning. We have less money available at the national level. Industry is picking up some mm -hmm. of this. Secondly, we are having markedly, uh, practically zero money almost for training fellowships so that, that now there are fewer dental scientists being trained to fill this gap you see mm -hmm. in the research yep. community. Yep. And who, is going, who are going to replace the current researchers? Who's going to replace the... Right. The, the names and not just materials but all of dental research. I, I want to stay with the students for another little while because I think probably when we people talk about you they, they talk about not only your contribution to continuing education but your your role as a teacher in the, the pre-doctoral program. Um, what, what makes for a good teacher? Um, I think, uh, I don't know. Um, I, what, what makes you a good teacher? Well, uh, uh, on the assumption again that, that I am, but I, I try to take most of the beginning lectures in uh, materials to our undergraduate students, to our auxiliaries, simply because I, I feel it's very wrong for a student to, to use a book by, authored by a member of the faculty and never see mm -hmm. that person. I think that's bad. And I, I just happen, it's, it's a challenge to me to, to begin them trying to, again, you see, develop this philosophy that this is not a hurdle. Mm -hmm. This is something that's going to be clinically oriented, clinically important to them mm -hmm. in, in dental mm -hmm. practice. What makes a good teacher then? I think much the same, m many of the same uh, facets that apply to a good lecture, period. I look around at, at people who, who I've heard lecture that I admire. Bob Shira, whom you know, mm -hmm. of course, and others who, who really have commanded respect and command the attention of their audience, usually boils down to three or four things maybe. One is uh, uh, having a, a, a feel for your, your knowledge. Mm -hmm. you, you have to not be egotistical, but you've got to feel that you maybe know as much or more about than everybody mm -hmm. else out there, and you're certainly your student. Secondly is experience you know, not getting nervous and this type of thing. Uh, 
thirdly, you know what I would rank most important? Enthusiasm. Yeah. And, and particularly yeah. in my field, you can cover up a lot of mistakes by, by that, particularly if you're talking about fundamental mm. properties of mm. materials which can kill an audience mm. off, you know. And same thing with students, probably those capabilities. Yeah, and I, I qualities. Think, yeah, and I think what probably certainly shows through, and and as we're talking now, is is your enthusiasm for the subject. Oh yeah, well I yeah I'm I'm completely warped on that, no <laughs> doubt about it, no doubt. Let's let's take a minute now to just take a break for All right. a, a little bit, and then we'll I want to kind of pick up again and and get into a little Fine. bit more about you about okay. personally. I'd love to. Okay. Ralph, what I want to do is, is really ask you a question about something that you wrote I know a while ago, and I want to know if you still feel that it's true. And, and it's really in light of, of what you had presented in, in terms of what appears to be some very exciting possibilities in, in dental materials research. And, and, and you said, um, uh, uh, I must tend to the suggestion that the possible dramatic changes in the nature of research in dental biomaterials, which I previously outlined, will not likely occur. In fact, I would make the conservative prediction that for the foreseeable future, the areas of investigation will remain fairly constant. Um, do, you, do you still feel that way? Uh, when did I write that? That was 1977. Uh, I'd have to go back and see what I said before that, yeah. probably. But I think they will, because I, I think you think I they will be constant? Yeah, I, I think fairly so. Within the broad categories, such as, as we've already talked about, uh, resin systems, adhesion, and so forth, I think that's probably true. I think that's probably true. Now, you must appreciate that sometimes my predictions are, uh, have a little bit to be desired. I, I would predict today, right now, on this program, that within three years, dentists will be using a truly adhesive filling material that will cho change completely all of the operative industry that is being taught at this school. Now, I've made that prediction every year <laughs> for uh, over a decade, so this is a question of how long I live. It's as simple as that. Yeah, right. So, so yeah, you're, right. you're going to hedge one these years. days. One these yeah, days. Yes. Yeah. But, we, but we're getting closer. Yeah, we're getting closer. Okay. Right. Um, one of the things that that also occurred to me is as I. I I went through your CV and, and all the accomplishments is how much you've done on the international scene. And I know up to now we've sort of talked about American dentistry and American research. Um, what do you see happening internationally? Oh, good. Um, again, this is one of the great changes that has occurred. Maybe it's, it's due to two things. One is, is the greater interest in what's going on outside the United States. One is due to the lines of communication being extended now um, more and more throughout the world. Maybe a better appreciation of scientists here that all of the research in the world is not certainly housed in the United States. Uh, for the scientist, for the dentist, to feel that he must use products uh, or must pay attention to only the research going on in the United States is totally wrong. In talking mm -hmm. to a dental society, for example, five years ago, I would seldom, if ever, have mentioned a foreign product. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'm, I'm uh, from Indiana, very conservative state, and we wave the American flag, and rightly so. But you, you have to pay attention to what's going on elsewhere. Dick, look, at, specifically in the area of material, you look at the field of adhesion. The polycrylic acid materials, polycarboxylic glass on them or cement. American? No. That all came out of England and, and Europe and Japan. You look at the composite field, the two trends that have occurred in the past decade that have had a tremendous transition then in terms of clinical dentistry have been light cured systems, visible light. That's European to begin with, basically. The difference in the nature of the composite that is like here, microfilled hybrid materials, that also came outside. So, so yes, we pay attention to what's going on. I have with me each year visiting scientists from other countries. I have two from Japan right now, a new one coming in. Last year we had Dr. Osman from Egypt. I have with me on a sabbatical for six months uh, Dr. Ko, who is from Malaysia. Uh, so, and as I, we're talking about it at breakfast, I have a, a graduate student, a scientist from Shanghai. He was the first of the graduate students in dentistry in the United States from the People's Republic of China. So we, we welcome those people and they have a, a great 
influence upon our thinking. The, the, one more example, if I might bore you with it. Felix Lutz, you may not know, but, but Dr. Lutz is head of, of uh, so-called conservative dentistry in Zurich, which embraces perio and uh, restorative dentistry. But uh, a few years ago, he wanted to come over. He, he, in, in, my now, in my way of thinking, he's probably the most knowledgeable man in the area of clinical observations on composite resin mm -hmm. systems. So he wanted to come over and, and spend a time with us uh, melding together his research activities with ours. He spent two years with me. We yeah. published a series of papers to get a classification system for resin and so forth. So this was a good example of a visiting scientist at a very high level from uh, outside the continental mm -hmm. United States that came with us. We learned from that. I think he learned from, from what we were thinking. Are, are the European countries making a, a larger investment, I mean, in, in and possibly Japan making a larger investment in dental materials research than the U.S. is? Dollar-wise, I don't know. I, I think in some cases they, they uh, have, have uh, certainly invested more money. The Netherlands, for example, Holland, has, mm -hmm. has a, a big materials research investment from the government, mm -hmm. particularly at Nijmegen. One of the best centers of clinical research is, is there with Freehoff and so forth. Uh, Japan has spent an awful lot of money, both nationally mm -hmm. and industrial-wise, in research. One of the reasons, I think, that you see greater activity, particularly in clinical research, sometimes in those countries in the United States, is that they have greater freedom from the standpoint of regulatory agencies. They're not bound in quite as tightly with mm -hmm. FDA restrictions and mm -hmm. so forth. Do you feel at all that the, the U.S. might be losing its competitive edge in, in or leadership in dental materials? Yeah. I think that's a. Uh, I think they still have the great edge, but but the way you worded it, they're beginning to lose that that advantage. I, I think so. Uh, that other other countries, by virtue of I don't know whether it's it's uh, been able to do a better job of attracting people in basic sciences into the framework of dental research, whether it is the the uh, expanding mm. industrial activity in those countries which are garnering mm. and supporting research. But certainly this is true. Certainly this is true. Hmm. Interesting. And, and, and part of this also is, is the fact that other countries now do have specification programs uh, as we have long had in the United States. Yeah. Let me, let me turn things a little bit and, and talk, um, talk a little bit about you. Um, Ralph, as, as you think about your career now in, in dental materials and, and over a, a, a long experience in, in that area, what would you like to get remembered for? Uh, well, uh, I don't know. I suppose I would, I would best want to be remembered by the things that I talked about at the very beginning, and that is, uh, made a decided effort, whether successful or not, time will tell, but a decided effort to, to one, entice young people into research in the field through graduate programs, even at the undergraduate mm -hmm. level. Secondly, maybe more important, is try to, to uh, make research palatable and useful to the profession. Mm -hmm. that, that, as I have said over and over again, has been where we felt comfortable, where we tried to do something, I think we have accomplished that to a certain extent. Mm. When you when you look back again, do you, is there anything? I, let, let me add one other okay. thing, Dick. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. You're the big boss on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> you no. thought you were, but you ran into me. <laughs> but one other thing, and that is that that that. It, the success I've had, I, I want to get this in before the program ends. Uh, the success we've, that I have had personally has been due to, to a number of, of things. One is a certain amount of ability by rank that probably it would weight that least. A lot of hard work, as with any, any uh, career. Thirdly is having been surrounded, as I also pointed out, with an administration that has been supportive of what we were doing, mm -hmm. and also a people, bodies around me, 
the Swartzes, the Normans, the, the Moors, the Snells, and you'll find their names in the literature as much as mine. These are loyal people who remain with me, group of technical assistants, uh, alumni who have supported our program, an SEM facility that we have mm -hmm. was donated by Dr. Kimshi from Washington, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact, who have been very loyal to our program. And uh, lastly, and more important than anything else, is counsel by dentists around the world. Hmm. Dentists who, early in my career, uh, the person who's going to have an interview this afternoon, Dr. Thompson, was one of those people, as I mentioned him this morning, that, that when I was starting in, was kind enough to share his problems with me. As a clinician. Yeah, as a clinician. Taught me dentistry. I needed to know it. I needed mm. to what the problems were, because, mm. you know, you have to work on the right things. Um, and and, and I, I can name others, the Hollenbecks and people on, uh, Earl Collard, our, our friend, who's also been, been very patient with me, uh, who's, who's given me moral support, you see, for what we were mm -hmm. doing. And I think that probably more than anything else, that, that uh, uh, cadre of dentists around the world who, who have listened to what we were saying, who have, who have uh, pointed us in the right direction. I, I think that's important, and I, just to, to repeat it, I, I think that, I mean, we spent the first part of the program talking about what the, the scientist could teach the clinician, and now you're talking about, you know, how much you've learned from the clinicians. That's oh, two indeed. Three. You bet your life. Uh, Has to be that way. It, that, that recalls something. I mean, you've talked about the people that, that, have, that you've learned from. Who, who are your models? Who, who did you see? Uh, to role models? I, I, I don't know that I could cite any individual. I, I suppose that, that a role model for me as much as any, it was George Paffenbarger. You remember mm -hmm. George, who, mm. who passed away recently after a long illness, very courageous person. But, but George Paffenbarger was, uh, came out of Ohio State and then uh, uh, went to the Bureau of Standards. He was mm -hmm. the chief of the American Dental Association Fellowship there. There was, there was hardly a, a dentist in the United States that didn't know Paffenbarger. Uh, a parallel to him was Alan Docking, who mm -hmm. died recently of diabetes, but in Australia, who headed up the, the, the Commonwealth Bureau of Standards down there. And I've been in Australia with Alan, and, and every dentist knew him by first name. And they did Paffenbarger. And you see, George was, was again, a person who, who dealt in laboratory research, developing specification mm -hmm. program, but felt that, that this was useful only if the dentist understood the purpose behind it right. and translated research into clinical experience. More than that, he was a gentleman. He was mm -hmm. one of the finest, kindest, most compassionate people I have ever mm -hmm. known. Ohio State uh, has created a chair in his honor, and I had the opportunity to ask me, and I'm not a graduate there, if I would write the introductory letter to the brochure went out and I, it was a flattering offer to me. I suppose uh, of all, there are many of them, but George as much as any because of the atmosphere that surrounded him and the way he, he acted as an individual and his dedication. Let me, let me take the, the flip side of that earlier question. And, um, do, you, do you have any regrets? Would there be any things that you would have done differently? Uh, learned how to play the trumpet better, so I have <laughs> another Harry James, you think, Basketball like group. that. Yeah, right. Uh, knowing how to refuse to do programs like this would be another. Uh, no, I, as a matter of fact, I wanted to say at the beginning that I'm, I'm very flattered to have this chance to do for the international, do this for the International College, and, and as I look at the people gone before me, I, I hope this is not the end of, of what has been a memorable series, I think. Um, I, strangely enough, no. Mm -hmm. I probably, if I had to go the route again, a few little things, but by and large, the, the same, I think. I, I think, and everybody reminisces about their early life, I, I think that even the, the difficulties that I experienced as, as a child, for example, mm -hmm. were all good. I, uh, uh, I, I get very bored with talking about where you're born and all that, but I think in, in the case of looking at an individual, uh, my father, as I pointed out, was a Methodist minister. 
and and, and had uh, had graduate training at theology from Boston, graduated from DePaul in Indiana, and then at the at really the beginning of his career, why encephalitis when I was six months old. Mm. So my mother had a background in science, so we went down to Salem, Indiana, and she taught science there, and and she essentially raised me, and uh, we were as everybody goes through, we're poor on a peel potatoes to get through college along with playing a horn and that type of, of thing. Uh, but, but one thing always bothered me about, about my father's illness, and as a, as a child I couldn't understand this. Why would, would God in all his compassion strike down a person who was, you know, teaching mm -hmm. religion, theology? Why would he do that to that type of individual? I asked my mother, I said, I don't understand it. I can see, you know, somebody out here who's not doing anything for society. Mm -hmm. And her only explanation, I've often thought about this, she said, well, virtue of, by virtue of, of your father having that illness and being taken pretty much out of our life, that made she and me stronger, mm -hmm. that we became stronger. And, and I often think back if my father, who was a very strong person, had, had been living up, what I would have been, would I have gone into law? Would mm -hmm. I have gone into theology, even though maybe mm -hmm. I wasn't cut out for that because this is what he wanted and I would have done mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. You know, things like that, that happened. That's, that's aside from your question. But no, I probably wouldn't have uh, changed anything. I probably, if I would have had the capability, would have liked to have had a dental degree Mm -hmm. Along with it, I think it would ease my thing. I, I would be very sympathetic, though, for the public if I'd had to do dentistry on them because mm -hmm. my manual dexterity is like zero. <laughs> but it would, that would have been helpful. But, but to take the time out to do that, mm -hmm. if I could have done it anyway, maybe I was better to spend it in developing uh, my research program. Yeah, and it's, it's, there's really both sides to it. I mean, and I and think I've, I've been fortunate, Dick, in that uh, you know, everybody is, but I feel yeah, particularly because uh, I've, had, I've had a lot of luck and I've had uh, been at the right place at the right time, but I've had a, a mixed uh, type of activity. Research, teaching, lecturing, um, writing text, which I enjoy, and the challenges there to have pertaining. Administrative duties, being associate dean at, at Indiana, being involved in, in national and international uh, committees and so forth. So it's a diversified type mm -hmm. of thing mm -hmm. that you don't get locked into doing one thing all the time. And, and I've, I've been able to do that simply again mm -hmm. because I've had good people that take yeah. care of the shop when I'm gone. When, when you look forward, is there something that you feel that you need to get done? Uh, yeah, catch a plane at 1245, <laughs> that's one thing. Short range. Yeah, that's short range. Long range, uh, no, I don't know. I, I, I guess, be it right or wrong, I've, I've tended to live uh, uh, more in the immediate future, in the foreseeable future in terms of our program, but I, mm -hmm. I, I can't think of anything that I've, I've this in the back of my mind that is compelling me that someday I've got to do that. No, I don't think so. Mm. Sounds strange, but I, and, and mm. I, I must admit that, that I don't really have a hobby. My work is my hobby. Mm. It, it truly is. So I, I tend to, to live this type of life. I enjoy it, and I, I don't think about, you know, giving this up to do something else that I've always yeah. wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And that's probably mm -hmm. bad because there's a time in life eventually when you have to say, well, I. I've got to, and I want to do something else, and I'll wait till that time comes. Yeah. Meantime, you're having fun. I'm having fun, sure. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 you know, I when I when I read what what people write, and and also even the things that um, you know people select, you know, in their own writings to quote from other people, I, I'm always sort of fascinated about uh, what that means. And I, there was something that I came across in in one of your articles that. Um, I thought was was kind of interesting, and I was sort of curious about it. And I'm not curious about it now. I mean, I, I've, I've kind of. I'd be fascinated if you quit reading what I've read. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to read something that you quoted from somebody else, which Good. is a quote from John like Gardner. That. But I, I think, in in lots of ways, talks about what we've been talking about for the last hour or so. Um, you were talking about excellence, and you you quote from John Gardner, who said, "An excellent plumber is infinitely more admirable than an incompetent philosopher." 
the society which scorns excellence in plumbing because plumbing is a humble activity and tolerates shoddiness in philosophy because it is an exalted activity will have neither good plumbing nor good philosophy. Neither its pipes nor its theories will hold water. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, I like that very much. Yeah. And it, I wish I'd been smart enough to think of it. That's yes. good. Well, you, you're smart enough to put it down. Yeah. Thank That's you, Ralph. Thank you. <laughs> that was super.